I would like to call to the stage a panel again on affordable housing. Karen Walsh, who is the facilitator of this, Catherine McKernan, Debbie Geopolis, Ramola Hollywood and Annabelle uh, Daniel. Now, Karen Walsh is a committed, a committed leader in the human services, um, housing and related corporate sectors, uh, possessing highly developed executive skills, networking strategies and policy skills, deep un and a deep understanding of the political environment and the social landscape, which influence and impact uh, the systems and business and a proven capacity to lead uh, in a con context of change. Uh, Catherine McKernan had, had joined Homeless New South Wales as the Chief, Exec Chief Executive Officer uh, in uh, February 2015 and has been a member of the Homeless Australian Board since 2016. Debbie Giannopoulos, I'm sorry if I'm mucking that pronunciation up. Georgopoulos, Georgopoulos thank you. Uh, Debbie joined the Women's Housing Company in April 2017 and is responsible for the strategic and operational leadership of the organisation. And Romola Hollywood. Romola. Rom I'm so sorry, Romola. 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 Um, is the Director of Policy and Advocacy with People uh, with Disability in Australia. Uh, PDWA, PWDA is a National Disability Rights Advocacy and Representative Organisation uh, made up, led and governed by people with disability. So thank you very much for your attendance. And Annabelle. Oh, have I forgotten somebody? <gasps> Annabelle, I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm doing well today. Um, Annabelle is the uh, CEO of the Women's Community Shelters. Um, she's worked with local communities around New South Wales to establish and open five shelters in as many years at Hornsby, Foster, um, Castle Hill, Penrith and Bayside. We're seven now. Really oh, seven. Okay. We need to cross that up, put something else in. Uh, she was collaborated with a range, a range of organisations, individuals and stakeholders from the community and all levels of government to achieve a change in the field of homelessness for women and children. So thank you. And I do apologise. Thank you very much. Okay, my name's Karen Walsh, as has already been said. I'm the CEO of Shelter New South Wales and I'm delighted to be here today to facilitate this session and I'd like to congratulate the Older Women's Network for putting this theme and this uh, subject matter on the agenda because as we all know it is a very important uh, subject area for us to cover. I'd just like to uh, recognise that we are meeting on Aboriginal land and to pay my respects to the custodians of this land that we're meeting on and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and also to acknowledge any Aboriginal people here today. We have a fabulous, as you can see, and from, the, from these uh, women's bios, a fabulous panel today. And uh, we will have a conversation about affordable housing, about the housing crisis in New South Wales, but also across Australia, and how that impacts on women, particularly older women, and this will also be an opportunity for us to hear from each of our panellists about what they're doing within their services to really make a difference. And um, I've actually had a good look at some of their websites. I've worked with all of them in their organisations, either in their existing capacity or in previous roles. So uh, we've actually got a really rich um, and deep expertise uh, on, this, on this stage today. So we're really fortunate. So I'd like to just open and um, say thank you for being on the panel. And I'd like each of you to just, you know, just to frame up the um, affordable housing, homelessness issues for older women. What, what would be your opening statement to, you know, to just inspire some of the thoughts and ideas today? What is your service doing to address this issue and you know, what would you like to say to the to the uh, conference for three or four minutes? That would be great, Catherine. Okay, I'll start. Um, 
I think the first thing I should say is that Homelessness New South Wales has worked with the Older Women's Network since about 2010 on this issue and both organisations or entities have been really, I guess, the canary in the mine around the issue of older women's homelessness and, and housing affordability issues. Um, and so uh, the last panel was very, I, I guess, was focusing on, focusing on the issues and the issues are stark in this space as well. So I don't want to dwell too much on, on, on that. But um, one thing I think is really good to see is that it's not just two lone voices and, and um, talking about this issue now. It, it's an issue that is well um, being focused on well, I think, in the broader media and within the sector particularly around the, the emerging, it will now very much emerged issues. Um, I think in terms of understanding the context, um, older women's homelessness is the unfortunately the fastest growing uh, cohort of homelessness in Australia. Um, it's increased by over 30% between the 2011 census and the 2016 census nationally. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of older women in uh, housing stress, so paying uh, more than 30% of their income on rent. Um, and if you look at the figures, 45% of older women, according to the 2016 census, uh, who are renting are, are paying more than 30% of their income or their pension on, on rent. So it's a huge issue, um, but it's also one that can be solved. And that's what we've all, all of the panel members have, have been talking about for a number of years. Um, the answer is in the name homelessness, it's actually housing um, and it's affordable housing. Um, and alongside that is of course financial independence and support for, for women more broadly so that when they get to be older that they are actually in a situation where they're not living in poverty and they're not living in um, substandard and expensive housing. Um, so New uh, Homelessness New South Wales in the early days was much, very much about advocacy and talking about the issue and working alongside the Older Women's Network around raising the issues. Since then we've um, released a document focused on New South Wales called A Place to Call Home and that was uh, done in 2016 I think um, and that was really practically focused on looking at what the policy changes are needed but also what practical things things we could do as a sector and um, Debbie I'm sure will talk about some of the work that women's housing has been doing and Annabelle will talk about what women's community short has been doing but it's been really great to actually do some practical things that provide some solutions for women um, whilst we do the advocacy work. Uh, and then the final thing I would say is nationally we've been working across um, the homelessness and community housing sector on the Everybody's Home campaign um, and really the answer as I said, is financial independence and affordable housing. And so we really need to continue to work on campaigning at a federal, state and local level for uh, a real investment in social housing. Um, we were advocating as part of the state and federal election campaigns around needing 500,000 social and affordable houses over the next 10 to 15 years. That's still the case. And so what the focus really needs to be on is, is really articulating the importance of affordable housing for everyone, but particularly for older women. Is this one? Yes, oh. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be part of this panel and thank you to the Older Women's Network for putting this issue um, on the agenda of this national conference. It's really significant that we um, are able to discuss it and particularly discuss solutions because in terms of the analysis of this issue, there's been a lot of work in the last few years, um, as Catherine has outlined. The statistics are shocking, they're alarming, but they're out there. There's nothing new. We know from the last census data the shocking increase in homelessness among older women and the fact that it's the fastest growing group, I think, um, is quite surprising um, for everyone in this community. Um, I often get, the women's housing companies are, uh, has been around for over 35 years in Sydney and now operating outside um, the metropolitan area, also in the Hunter and Coffs Harbour. We operate for, um, services from cr the crisis end, so we have a refuge, we have transitional housing through to social and affordable housing. So we have a picture of women's housing needs across that whole space. Um, Domestic violence was discussed a lot in the last session, so I don't need to go over that, but that is a common thread um, among women who find themselves in housing insecurity. But the other thing I'd like to say really clearly and loudly is we have a housing affordability crisis in this country. Sydney is the second least affordable city in the world second to Hong Kong. We don't hear about that often enough because that's an international statistic and we don't like to talk about it in this country, but that is the reality. 
So home ownership, actually, which most of um, public policy relied on to support people in their retirement, is becoming less and less a reality. I often get asked, why older women? What about young people? What about families? What about women with children, etc.? And I've had to think, um, think about this and to, to try and understand in my own mind why we would advocate for housing solutions specifically for this group. The thing is, we can't talk about older women as a point in time. Older women were once young women and women of childbearing age and women um, pre-retirement. Um, and if we don't do something about the factors that have contributed to older women's homelessness today, there, there will be similar conversations in 10 and 20 and 30 years' time because nothing will change. The, the factors that um, lead to women's homelessness other than domestic violence include the fact that many older women today had to leave the workforce when they were pregnant, including my mother. Um, uh, superannuation, which we talk about today as though it's part of the, the um, you know, social fabric of this country, Many of the older women today were, didn't have the benefit of superannuation when they started their careers. The fact that they worked in low paid work, the fact that they had to take time off, etc. Everybody in this room knows those issues. They are the things that combine to, along with the housing affordability crisis, to make older women um, a group that um, requires a particular policy response. And we at the Women's Housing Company, along with the other organisations here, we see the impact every day. Um, one of the figures that Catherine um, didn't mention is the waiting times for social housing, because that's where a lot of women who find themselves um, either homeless or at risk of homelessness turn to. 60,000 at the moment in New South Wales. Now, that's a shocking number. Um, 50,000 is a shocking number. 30,000 is a shocking number. But that is the situation. And so any older woman who applies for social housing today is likely to have to wait over 10 years for sure, but closer to 20 years. If you're 70, how is that a housing solution for you? Mm -hmm. um, at the point here end in terms of homelessness, we're getting to the point where our homelessness services, particularly the women's refuges that are still around, are turning away almost as many women as they're able to assist in any given year. So at that crisis end, we're also seeing uh, demand increasing and more and more unmet need. So it's a pretty dire situation. We need some solutions, we need some policy responses. We can talk more about them, but top of the list, I would say, is a national housing strategy. But we also need some immediate solutions targeting older women. And one that I would recommend very strongly is that in New South Wales, we decrease the eligibility for priority assessment to at least 70 rather than 80. Um, it could go lower, but it, it, it is a start. So we're not saying to our 71 and 72 and 75 year old women that are approaching us, go away and wait till you're 80 and then come back and update your application or come back and see us when you're in um, even more dire circumstances and perhaps then you may be eligible. That situation is not okay. Um, we have lots of models that work and we can talk more about those in the panel, uh, in the later discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. I'll just use this one because I've got it. <laughs> I'll just grab it. So hi, my name is Romola Hollywood and I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy with People with Disability Australia. And um, we're not actually a uh, service provider per se, we're actually a human rights um, organisation and we um, work to realise the rights of people with disability um, across Australia. And we're funded both as a uh, National Peak organisation and also as a New South Wales Peak organisation. We also uh, have individual advocacy, um, uh, individual advocates who work with women and men um, to try to ensure that they are able to realise their rights. And one of the key areas that they work in um, is trying to support people with disability to have access to housing. So one of the things that is um, a challenge is I could actually talk <laughs> enormously about 
um, we're, we're hearing about a lot of the problems, but they are multiplied when we're talking uh, um, for uh, women and people with disability. And um, I just wanted to share with you that uh, yesterday um, we put in a submission to the New South Wales Review of the Boarding House Act. Now, we actually have in New South Wales um, boarding houses, mostly inhabited by men, but there also are some women living in them, that are Dickensian places, owned by pro proprietors that provide food lodgings and they are often quite coercive environments. And we're, clo we're calling for them to be closed down. So I, I think that the, um, one of the things for people with disability and as a human rights organisation is that housing has been really key to the advocacy around rights. And that in fact housing has been one of the ways in which um, people with disability have had their rights violated because we've created environments where people are segregated from the community. So we're on a journey of um, trying to uh, close down segregated accommodation, group homes and enable people with disability, whether they're men or women, to be able to live in the community and choose with whom they live, where they live, and, um, and how they live and with appropriate supports. So I, it's, um, that is a huge, in terms of a policy agenda, it's, it's absolutely massive. So rather than going into all of the detail of that, and I'm happy to answer specific questions, I just wanted to focus on one key message here today, which is that when we talk about affordable housing, we also need to talk about accessible housing. So we can build an enormous amount of affordable housing, but if it's not accessible, we are going to be cre creating challenges, not just for people with disability, but actually for older people as well. So I'm just gonna share some st statistics with you. You might know these already, but the Australian Bureau of Statistics found that one in five people in Australia identify as having some form of disability. Now, that may not always be um, an, a, a physical disability that might create mobility um, issues. It may, that disability is, comes in all shapes and sizes. But, um, but if we think about that, it's one in five people. But when it comes to looking at older Australians, it, is in, it actually escalates to nearly 50% of people who are older identify as having disability. And then when we think about that, um, for women, the stats show that women find it harder. If you're a woman with disability, you find it harder to access appropriate services. Only 34% of women are in the NDIS. Now, only 10% of people with disability are ever going to be able to access the NDIS. That was the way the scheme is designed. It's for people with permanent and high support needs. But if you think about that, women are struggling to access the services. So that... Um, also means that um, in relation to affordable housing that uh, women are pro uh, struggling to access affordable housing and often the barriers are the fact that that housing is not actually accessible. So we were asked to identify one ask, one opportunity, one challenge, because we were supposed to identify success stories, but I'm, I'm kind of just identifying all the problems because I'm a policy person. But in terms of the um, an, an opportunity and something to think about is the we have been calling for the um, National Construction Code to include minimum standards for all new housing builds and where there's going to be extensive modifications to houses and homes and social housing, that would include social housing, that it has minimum standards for accessibility. And what we're coming up to is, um, there's been many advocacy groups and um, people with disability who've been advocating strongly for this. Uh, we are coming up to a a reg the release of a regulatory impact statement early next year, where it will be fleshing out the costs, the costs and benefits of moving to having minimum standards around accessibility. And we will find that developers, the housing groups, will say, we can't afford to do this. However, we need everybody to step up to the plate and say, no, this is an investment. 
We will not solve the issues of housing, of affordable housing, if it's not accessible. And if you think about it, many of us, as we age, may end up with disability. And so everybody wins if housing is accessible. So that's my challenge for you and my hope as well. So thank you. Thank you. We'll probably we'll discuss that a bit further in the session. Thank you. Over to you, Annabelle. Thank you. I'm Annabelle Daniel. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Women's Community Shelters. And aren't we a well-behaved panel? I sort of feel this incredible urge to bust out and be subversive <laughs> now. And We've only just started, though. Yeah, good point. We've only good just point. started. Um, so my organisation is fairly new uh, by a lot of terms. We only uh, inaugurated in 2011 and, and got into operations in 2013. Um, what we are is an organisation that works with local communities to establish new crisis accommodation shelters for women, um, single women, older women, women with children, women who are homeless or leaving domestic and family violence. Um, to date we've established, we're just about to open shelter number seven in Parramatta. I'm also working on two more. And as we've been doing that, um, acknowledging that the crisis accommodation uh, side of things is a short-term solution, albeit incredibly necessary, um, we find that for each bed that we have available in any one of our shelters, we get between three and four requests for it. So the demand is absolutely overwhelming. Um, since we began, we, we've been establishing shelters. One of the, the other things that we've been doing is addressing the, the other elements of that in terms of building housing pathways. And um, as we've built relationships with non-traditional partners in the sector, like developers, like the private sector, we're starting to make use of transitional housing models and meanwhile use, which is properties that might be underutilised or standing empty because they've been purchased pending development or land banking, to be able to work with those property and landholders to be able to utilise those to provide secure housing for women who are leaving crisis for a few years and work towards those permanency pathways. And that, that pardon me, that's in addition to um, the work that we're doing around supporting um, economic independence and uh, finding employment, employment education and training pathways. Um, we very much had our genesis in supporting um, older women. Our, um, our, our birthplace came from our founders' creation of the Manly Women's Shelter, which is now known as the Northern Beaches Women's Shelter. And what our founders uh, found was that in that area in 2010, there were more than 300 women that were approaching the Northern Beaches Community Centre looking for a safe place to go. And so many of these women were um, older women who had actually had, you know, incredibly conventional lives by everybody's standards. They'd raised families, they'd cared for family members, ageing parents, they'd worked part-time. The superannuation issue was, you know, always in play. They didn't have um, savings to fall back on. They might have experienced a bereavement in terms of a partner or domestic and family violence. Um, and, you know, the precarity of those circumstances meant that they could become homeless very, very quickly. Um, included, of course, is the, the absolute paucity of the New Start allowance, which was available, you know, to women, um, you know, from, from 50 to 65, and now that, that age is, limit is, is actually increasing. And so, the work um, towards supporting uh, older women is very, very much a part of our DNA. We continue to support that group and to put together innovative housing solutions. Um, and for me, one of the, the proudest parts of what we've done this year is work, um, work in partnership with um, a number of groups um, to inaugurate Beecroft House, which is affordable housing for um, up to 20 older women um, in Beecroft in Sydney's northern suburbs um, for a few years and then with guaranteed permanency housing pathways um, out of Beecroft House. And I think for me, in the absence of a national housing strategy and in the absence of any evidence of will towards a national housing strategy, we have got to be clever and we've got to inaugurate our own solutions. I'm very much... Um, come from an action-oriented place, community organising place. We are a capacity building organisation in our DNA and there's nothing I like better than actually working with local community groups, non-traditional partners, people who are interested in solutions and being that backbone to drive towards something that will actually produce a result. Because in the absence of a, of a top-down strategy, then grassroots up is the way, that we, the way to go and I'm really keen to do more of these projects. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Annabelle. Okay, so some great messages. I've just 
jot it down a few. So some of the asks so far are about um, obviously a national housing strategy that actually is underpinned by the evidence and the will of government to actually drive that and invest in that. Uh, investment in social housing, and I know that uh, the the percentage of social housing over the in recent years has gone down from about 5.6% to about 4.2% in New South Wales, and in Victoria it's about 2.6 or 2.8%. So we have a growing population, a growing need, we've got an older population, but the social housing supply, the gap is getting even bigger. So it's absolutely critical that the investment in social housing and in affordable housing is grown. Uh, talking about the closure of boarding houses that are not actually being of service to uh, people with disabilities in particular. And also um, policy changes, including uh, reducing the priority aged from 80 to 70, which I think makes absolute sense. Uh, because you, as Debbie said, you have to uh, be 80 before you can actually be considered priority on the Housing Pathways waiting list. So, uh, and, and another key message is we absolutely need to create our own solutions. We should not only be relying on government to drive this, we've actually got to drive it ourselves as well. So, so in that vein, um, I'm interested in hearing, you know, we're, we, we talked about housing policy and policy to address homelessness and housing stress and that growing demand and the growing problem. Is it just about housing policy or is it about something else? You know, what else can, what else needs to be done within the system to, to address these policy failings? Catherine. Uh, well, I mean, I think of just thinking about the earlier panel and the conversation about the patriarchal constructs of our society and um, that's partly why we've managed to get to the point we have with the number of older women who are experiencing homelessness now. The systems are structured in a way that disadvantage women because of the way in which people have taken time out to care for children or have been forced out of work because they're pregnant. Um, the superannuation is not as, as high and so the whole kind of pension and the p age pension is predicated on home ownership. Um, so the whole structure of um, support for older women, older people is is geared towards men. And so that that those those structures need to be really understood and changed. But alongside that, we need to start seeing housing as a feminist issue as well. Um, you know, housing is you cannot do anything, you cannot resolve any other issues in your life if you don't have a safe and secure place to live. And it's not understood enough in, in the broader context around social policy, discussion of infrastructure, et cetera, around how crucial having safe and affordable housing is. And so those are the two things that we really need to start um, holding government and community and media to account really in how we talk about these things and talk about how how vital social housing and affordable housing is, but also how important it is to look at the structures that are supposedly supporting our society and, and how they're actually impacting on women. Yeah, I would add to that and I would just simply say that we need to continually push to have a gendered lens on the way that government policy impacts. What are the impacts going to be on women? What are the impacts going to be on women? We need to encourage media to ask, you know, to hold our politicians to account, as you say, around those questions because we know that whenever something appears to be gender neutral, it will always end up disadvantaging women. That's the way it rolls. And I think, you know, in, in terms of those questions, in terms of the, the, the policy, we just have to keep pushing back on government and insisting that they realise that the causes of homelessness are gendered, that the way that these policies, you know, policies around social security, policies around, uh, you know, wait list and ages and everything, all of those things will have differing impacts and we can't lose sight of that. We have to keep talking to that point. I absolutely agree with both um, suggestions. We've we've got to look at the long term and have policy interventions that look at improving women's economic security. We need policy changes um, in terms of the immediate assistance, <coughs> but there's no there's no silver bullet. <coughs> Sorry, I've got a bit of a cold. There's no silver bullet to addressing the immediate impact of homelessness. Um, we, we actually need it all, including reform of the private rental market. Um, the reality is that there are lots of women who find themselves today in a position where home ownership is no longer even an option. So let's not pretend that that, that is a solution. Um, social uh, housing is 
quite elusive and crisis is only for the crisis and so that leaves us with the private rental market and precarious as that is we actually have to give that some attention we have to look at how um, women can stay renting affordably in the private rental market, how they can, uh, it can be harder to evict them, how they can have longer term tenure and how there may be some medium term assistance via some targeted subsidies from the government. Is this ideal? No, but we do it because we can and an increase to the Commonwealth rent assistance and or um, some subsidies for the private rental market where that may be a possibility for women is also, I think, um, worth looking at, absolutely worth looking at. Thank you. I think there's a lot in that question and I guess what's running through my head is um, thinking about um, the fact that um, we need to think about how our policies are also inclusive of all people. And I think in the last session, somebody raised the question of violence um, and that women experience. Women with disability are more likely to be exposed to violence. And we have a Royal Commission coming up into violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability. And in fact, some of the horrific stories that we know we will hear relate to the settings in which people are living and the fact that we have created a world of segregated housing for people with disability and that we need to shift that. So I think that my challenge, and I know that we've already started to have conversations, is around in the social and affordable housing area, that as I said, we need to think about what is built in the future being fully accessible, regardless of whether it's in the National Construction Code as well, but it'd be good if it was mandated. But we also need to be thinking about how we as organisations are creating um, housing, supports, and also communities that are accessible and don't segregate, create segregated communities because that's where violence can start to escalate and occur. So that would be my challenge for all of us. We all have a place to play and part to play in that. Thank you. So leading on from that, I was just picking up on some of your, your points and it raised a thought with me because um, Shelter New South Wales is an advocacy housing policy peak. So recently we dealt with uh, an issue which was a development application in a regional area that was refused and uh, that development application actually included, uh, it was a community housing provider looking to develop affordable housing which included housing for older people including older women. And the council made a determination that it would not be, um, it would have negative social impacts, it would have negative economic impacts, it would reduce property values. And there's this whole scaremongering out there in the community that um, people are actually buying into. So that's one issue at a local level and at a community level, but we also need to, I mean, I think you talked about needing to the evidence and the will to convince government for a national housing strategy. So how do we actually change the narrative? How do we change the discourse and the conversation to get both the community and government at all levels to really get that this is really important and you know needs to be done? What do we actually do to, what are some of your ideas about how we can change that conversation? Can I have a, a go from the community perspective? Um, as a community capacity building organisation, I think what, what we've seen, and, and particularly with the Beecroft House project um, that, that we've, just, um, we've just undertaken, um, I actually have a slightly more hopeful spin <laughs> on things in only that if you do community engagement really well, and if you start a conversation with communities about the benefits that you know, community housing or the, that supporting, um, you know, a particular group can bring um, and ask them how they can help and how they can contribute. We've had incredibly positive responses. I mean, we've had, pos we've, we've, we've had situations where, you know, in, in areas where we've been, we've been setting up shelters for, for women and their kids who are leaving domestic and family violence, 
you know, we've started off from a place of almost violent opposition to what we're doing, to uh, conducting what is effectively a community education process about, about how we do this and how we manage any issues and all of those kinds of things. Um, to, you know, providing a phone number of a manager and saying, look, if you've got any issues here, talk. And so, from my point of view, we can manage some of these issues by doing really good community consultation before it starts, as opposed to dropping in with a, you know, with, with a plan and a proposal where the community might first see it when it's, you know, when it's exhibited at council. So I'm actually a huge fan of the community engagement approach in helping to manage some of the negative stereotyping around any particular group. Um, and what, what we did at, um, at Beecroft was, we held a community forum at the local one of the local uh, bowling clubs. We invited people to come along. The Civic Trust came along, a number of other interested community groups. We had about 60 people in the room and we talked about the proposal of what we were going to do with this, this beautiful disused um, uh, aged care facility that, that had been sitting unoccupied. And, you know, we're expecting some lev level of negativity to a person, everyone who was there said, what can we do to help? What can we do to make a difference? And so from my point of view, I think in doing something, in, in doing some of these projects, working at that grassroots level and engaging people in a community towards a joint aim um, can be really, really powerful way of working. And just to pick up on the joint aim point, um, with Everybody's Home, in putting together the Everybody's Home campaign, um, we actually did some market research and some testing at, out in the broader Australian community around what people's perceptions were around homelessness and housing. Um, and what what we found was um, there's an assumption in the media that it's a young person's issue, that people can't afford to buy homes and there's a whole lot of there's an article almost every week about how young people are feeling uh, excluded by baby boomers and that they're not able to access through the housing market and the baby boomers have had it easy, et cetera, et cetera. What, what the research actually found was that this, was, this issue was, as you would all know, impacting across generations and the media and the government is actually using that uh, generational... Uh, divide as a way of not actually addressing the issue and so part of the work that we've been trying to do around everybody's home if you look at it it's very positive it's very focused on solutions and what we found was as we know because older women's homelessness is a big issue but it's not only that older people are supporting younger people because they can't they can't access young, younger people can't accessing access housing and so there's this whole the whole spectrum of the issue is being impacted across society, but we're not articulating it that way. And so it's really, really important for when we're talking about older women's homelessness or uh, housing issues in the media, either older or younger, we actually need to be talking about this as a collective issue across generations and impacting everybody and how we, we actually all need to work together to address it. And how we address it is through housing and we know how to do that. We just need the resource and investment. Thank you. So, does it always work? Does it always work? Well, as you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm being provoked. We got here. nothing uh, yes. at the moment. Um, I think. I think that what we've got, what we, what we saw with the federal election in particular, is that we. Uh, I, I think the positives. Well, the positives we can take from the um, since the federal election is that the Liberal government now has an assistant minister on housing and homelessness and community housing and a minister for housing, which they didn't have prior to the election. Now, it doesn't sound like much, but it does indicate that they have heard that it's an issue. And so really what, this, what we've been doing and reflecting after the election is the importance of continuing to campaign, continuing to try and influence the, the narrative within the media around the issue, around around but also around the solution so not moving like the media love to talk about the issues older women's homelessness is there's an article almost every week there's a radio there's people talking about it all the time but nobody's actually talking about what the solution is and so what we've been trying to do is really hold the line around there is a solution we know how to do this if you look at other other countries they can do it they've done it through investing in social housing and providing affordable housing that's what we need to do and just holding that la line and maintaining it and trying to influence those people within the media who talk about these issues to to talk about this as well thank you thank you Catherine okay any more comments on that question or I think we can open questions to the floor now Sharon I think you'll need to wait for a mic so that they can hear it on the uh, film footage.
I'm sitting here mad as hell, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> you know, that's often a state of affairs for me. Um, look, you know, I, I, I do, I understand that we can't rely on government. Um, um, Annabelle, your, your initiatives have, uh, have, have proven that out, that we can't wait for governments to come to the fore. But I don't think we can take the pressure off in any way, shape or form. No, nor but, should we. No, nor uh, should we. because what, what I'm seeing and what I'm mad as hell about is, you know, the move to outsource um, uh, affordable housing to community housing providers and the security of tenure or lack thereof for particularly older women they move in it's just it's just pseudo private rental we have private landlords who are not doing repairs that they should be doing which you know used to be the government's responsibility in government housing um, that you know and at, at, at a whim they can sell their investment property and move on and you've got an older woman who's who who is generally offered some other form of housing but it could be in a completely different area and they've got to uproot themselves after a, a you know jumping through a million burning hoops to get the fucking place in the first place and there they are at the at the whim of a private landlord you know it's it's something that the government should be doing, not outsourced, as they have done with women's refuges, outsource it to, to somebody else, you know, you know, the pseudo NGOs that, that are providing those services. You know, we are just looking at another level of Clayton's privatisation. So, Sharon, are you, are you looking for um, government to invest more in public housing but also to do the repairs and maintenance on the buildings and have better rental rights? All of those. All of those things? All of those. And okay. it should be the right of every woman mm. and child and, you know, everybody who cannot afford to enter the private m market, which is just about everybody full stop, to have that provided by our government, stop privatising what should be a government responsibility. Thank you. Would someone like to respond to that comment or I question? Just, can, I yeah. Clarify, yeah. can I clarify something? La, 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 the, la. What we have is a multi-provider system where public housing and community housing are working um, side by side. Uh, it's That's not privatising if it's going to the not-for-profit sector because we're regulated under national law. We have standards, in fact, higher standards than public housing and we invest in the properties. What I think is causing issues is the multitude of programs that don't provide permanent housing but where we have to rely on the private rental market to lease a property and then provide support and they're convoluted programs because there isn't the long-term investment and community housing providers find managing those as tricky as everybody else does and we do the best we can. What would be better if there was a housing um, strategy that delivered ongoing permanent housing for what we needed mm. and for the very complex clients, let's stop pretending that we can manage really complex clients in private rental. There are some people, um, including women but men as well, who have had such long complex histories of homelessness that giving them a home and saying here are your keys, pay your rent, look after the place is going to be okay they're likely to need lifelong support and we need housing first models like Common Ground uh, to support those very, very complex people or people with complex circumstances rather. No, okay. Another, I think we had a question over here first. All right, where is she? Okay. Uh, I just wanted to ask the panel what I'm oh, sorry. I just wanted to ask the panel what you know about the new um, boarding house developments. So from my understanding, the government changed regulation so developers, we would get a lot more developers building boarding houses. Um, they don't have to abide by a lot of the normal regulations for building um, high rise units. Um, in the area that I live in, in the inner west, we've had a minimum of eight applications for boarding houses. Now, from the information that I've been given, is the government were trying to encourage affordable housing, low rents, um, but then I've had feedback that the rent, although it was supposed to be around $395, it's not at all, there'd been, the developers are charging a lot more in excess of that, and more around 700 and even renting them out as Uber. So um, I've even had a conversation with a, um, a church group, 
a metropolitan church group who wanted to put a church down near us and build a boarding house. And when I asked about who they would be looking to use the boarding house, they said, oh, well, NDIS is providing a lot of money, so people with disability and people in housing stress are probably people with mental health. Now, I understand all these people need housing, but I have an issue about segregation and congregation of people and, again, the social issues around that. So we're in a very small um, municipality in the inner west and I know of at least eight applications for boarding houses. So is that going to solve any problem or what are the issues around that? Did, did you want to... Romola? Uh, um, thanks for the question and I think that... Um, it, your question goes to some of the complexity that exists within um, housing policy. And what I... Oh, okay, because I was just going to... I, I, I will talk about it in relation to specialist disability accommodation yeah, as well and what it is and isn't in relation to boarding houses. But if you want to answer it in relation to the boarding house, SEP, um, and how that's being misused... I'm go for it. We've only got a couple of minutes, so I would suggest that that level of detail probably needs to be discussed at afternoon tea because I know we've got a couple more questions. So I'm. Do you want it, me to it will be a technical response, I'm sure. I know I can but respond just briefly on that. Okay, thank you. If you could, are you happy for that, Romola? <laughs> I am. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm also a community rep on a planning panel, so I live in microphone. Oh. So uh, there are lots of loopholes in the boarding house sector from a planning perspective. So the developers do get bonus floor space, so more height, more area, and they don't have to deliver on things like parking or sustainability, so they have reduced, and they're very controversial in communities. And I also agree, some of the ones I've acted for a few families where I live in Ramwick, where they've had boarding houses next door, and I've seen them finally developed and there is no way that is being used as affordable housing because they're just Airbnbs that are being rented out for people who are visiting the eastern suburbs. So, but they're being sold as, you know, they're being used for the students at UNSW and for the hospital, but it's definitely a poor loophole. The government has changed some of the regulations around boarding houses from a planning perspective, but I think there's a long way to go in that sector. Yes, and there's a whole other layer which is government's investment in um, the, the Australian government's investment in what's called specialist disability accommodation. And that is not actually about boarding houses. It is actually supposed to be about um, purpose-built um, and designed homes in the community for people with disability, a very small amount, of, with um, high support needs so that they can live in the community. And that's a whole nother policy area which I won't bore you with, but I can tell you there's a lot of Macquarie banks and big investors trying to get their piece of the pie on that one. Thank you. And uh, if anyone's interested, Shelter New South Wales also made a submission to that review. So our submission is on our website, so you can read about it there. Did you want to ask a question? I think somebody needs to get a microphone to the next. Okay. Can you stand so I can see you? Thank you. Thank you. I'd like Annabelle to answer my question. Women and children going to shelters, having to leave their family, their friends, their schools. We're tackling... The, we're not tackling the problem. We're, we're looking... Please... What can we do? Um, I, again, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, for me, I think, and again, it goes a little bit back to back to the model. I mean, referencing the panel earlier, you know, I've um, only been in, in the sector proper for about a decade compared to some others. That's not a very long time. Um, but I guess from, from what I see, the demand for our services is only increasing. I would love an Australia where I don't have to do what I do. Um, the ultimate aim of what I'm doing, I would love to be in a position in 10, 15, 20 years where we close all our shelters down because mm. domestic and family violence has gone down to such an extent. You know, there are plenty of beautiful beaches in Australia I could sit on instead. However, 
Um, unt unless and until we, we get to solving that problem, the services that we provide are only expanding and are only more necessary. Now, for me, part of the stuff that we need to do and part of the, way, part of the reason why we have the model that we do is because we discovered that when you're establishing shelters in partnership with, your, with a community, you're actually taking a community on an education journey around domestic and family violence and women's homelessness. And we have lots of people involved at the local level as volunteers and on shelter boards. They were starting to get ad hoc requests to talk at preschools and primary schools and high schools and service clubs and churches and all kinds of groups about the work of that shelter in the community. And so for me, um, we've, we've formalised that into a high school program now um, for called Walk the Talk, which is about respectful relationships education along with adopting your local shelter for a year essentially and doing a lot of the awareness raising, fundraising support and actual activity to do something to assist women and kids who are affected in the community right now and women who are homeless. And for me, that is how we so will solve this problem in the long term. It's not by helicoptering in some top-down solution or getting a politician to pin on a ribbon and say, this is terrible, we must change it. Yeah, we, 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 I'm, I'm talking to my experience, uh, I guess, when I'm saying... I, I'm saying I'd, I'd love it if that would happen, but I guess what I'm saying is working from the grassroots up and taking a whole community on a journey, a journey around these issues creates an awareness and a level of education that sinks in in a different way to just providing horrible stats and figures at the top level. People will... people come to these issues at different points in their own journey and if you can move the needle for them and make them understand that these issues are not something that, that's happening out there in that other suburb over there where people are really nasty to one another or come from different backgrounds or whatever, this is happening everywhere, then, then what you get is, I guess, a whole of community response to these things. And so tying into what we were talking about earlier, Wendy, I think really... This is a way of seizing our own power back around doing this stuff. It is about working in a different way. It is about providing that leadership at the local level to activate things and having a really clear path for how to achieve some change and how to set these services up. Thank you, Annabel. Um, I know you want to make a comment, but I, we really do need to go just, to the next I question. I just want to say... Um, What's been sort of happening in recent years is prime uh, sites have been reclaimed from social housing to be developed for private housing. And one of those in, I was very involved with was the Ivanhoe Estate near Macquarie University. A thousand people were there um, and have been subsequently uh, relocated. But uh, Jan Barham and Sophie Costas, um, Greens and Labor uh, MPs in the state government, set up an affordable housing inquiry uh, some years ago. Um, it uh, was, uh, like a lot of these inquiries, didn't really amount to much. But <clears throat> I live in Epping. And from my understanding, there is supposed to be an arrangement of 5% of new developments go to social housing. Since 2014, we've had uh, almost 6,000 new apartments built and we've got another 600 on the way. Now, if that rule applied, uh, and I think it should be 10%, because those apartments, studio apartments, are being sold for $800,000, so they're making huge amounts of profit. If it were 10% of 60,000 60, 60, units and the other 600 on the way, there'd be 60, there'd be 660 social housing units in Epping. Mm. Now, why are those laws not being applied? Because they are supposed to be stipulated. And I think the reason they are not being applied is because there is a very, very close and very intimate and very questionable alliance between developers and politicians. I think we'll take that as a comment, and I do. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, we really do need to wrap up this session. So I think we have identified a number of um, asks to government and to broader community and industry. But I think we it would be great if we could just hear any closing remarks from our panel members if you've got a message that you want to put out there so that it can go up on the board at the back. What would be the one thing you would want to see quickly? Oh, where are we, where are we starting with? <laughs> just pop. I mean, I think we've said really, we've we've summarised it all. I think I don't have anything more to add. I mean, yeah, and then the the the, the issue is the need for political action and um, a pro, you know structures and invo investment of resources to make that happen. Great, very simple from the women's housing company: more housing for women. Yeah, great. Thank you. And I just wanted to thank everybody uh, for their attention and also to um, thank the Older Women's Network for um, actually including, the dis expanding the discussion out to include people with disability and for us to have that Absolutely. as part of the um, uh, conversation today. And thank you. Thank you. Yep. And I just wanted to say, get organised and keep trying to do clever things. <laughs> Great messages. Thanks very much. Thank you to our panel. Thank you. So thank you very much, our panel.